Welcome. You're going to watch the video of the conference I delivered during my presidential lecture at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in San Diego in the fall of 2018. This conference was nicely introduced by Richard Huguenier, the president of the Society for Neuroscience. Enjoy. Good evening. I'm Rick Huguenier, president of the Society for Neuroscience. Welcome to the third Neuroscience 2018 Presidential Special Lecture. By attending the meeting, you will be provided with the opportunity to learn about what others around the world are doing in the field. And by the end of the meeting, you will hopefully have new ideas to pursue in your research, as well as possible new co collaborations. During my year as SFN president, one of my goals is to make sure we don't forget or lose sight of the reward and fun of research. Yeah. And, <laughs> and discovery and sharing these insights with others. As of this evening, our annual meeting attendance is 28,568. And now I'm very pleased to, to introduce this evening's presidential lecturer, uh, Daniel Choquet. <laughs> Dr. Choquet obtained an engineering degree from Ecole Centrale in Paris, where he became interested in neuroscience and completed his PhD in the lab of Henry Korn at the Pasteur Institute. There, he studied ion channels in lymphocytes and was eventually appointed tenure research officer at the CNRS. Dr. Choquet later performed a postdoctoral sabbatical at Duke University in North Carolina in the laboratory of Michael Sheets, where he studied the regulation of integrin cytoskeletal linkage by force and demonstrated that cells can sense and respond to extracellular traction. From there, he, has, he set up his group in, in Bordeaux, France, at the Institute for Neuroscience, where he received a, a directorship position. He is now heading the Institute for Interdisciplinary Neuroscience and the Bordeaux Imaging Center a core facility. He is also the director of the Center of Excellence at the Bordeaux Region Aquitaine Initiative for Neuroscience, or BRAIN. Dr. Choquet's research has focused on the synapse using high-resolution, cutting-edge imaging, and has a large, he has had a large impact on synaptic plasticity. His talk tonight is from nanoscale dynamic organization to plasticity of excitatory synapses and learning. So please welcome uh, Daniel to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Rick, for this uh, extremely kind introduction. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to deliver this presidential lecture tonight. This is an absolute immense honor for me, and I'm, I'm going to try to live up to it. So what I'm going to do tonight is try to take you with me on a journey which is going to go from uh, looking at the movement of glutamate receptors at the single molecule level inside synapses and then take you from there to try to understand how the dynamic of synaptic components is actually um, able to regulate the efficacy of synaptic transmission and eventually teach us new things on a higher uh, brain function. But before, uh, just a bit of history, because I, I like to put things into perspective. So it's uh, more than 130 years ago that uh, Ramon Nicaral, the very famous neuroscientist you all know, uh, proposed that the nervous system is actually composed of a network of uh, interconnected cells, which were uh, called neurons just a, a few years later. Uh, it's 10 years after that that uh, Foster and Sherrington uh, proposed the term synapse for those sites of contact between uh, neurons. Uh, we know now that uh, about 90% of synapses are excitatory, the other ones being uh, inhibitory. And uh, most of excitatory synapses are actually formed uh, here on uh, these small protrusions, which are called spines protruding from dendrites. Very early on, uh, Ramon Caral actually observed that these spines come in very different shapes and forms. And uh, that was indicated 
indicating that maybe uh, these elements were very important for uh, synaptic transmission uh, between uh, neurons. And so what we are going to do tonight is really look at to, into exquisite details at the structure of these uh, synapses and the dynamics of these structures and trying to relate those dynamics to uh, synaptic function. So probably the most uh, classical and ancient way to look at uh, high resolution at the the ultrastructure of synapses is by electron microscopy. You've seen this type of images uh, hundreds and hundreds of times. This is a very archetypal, archetypal view of a spine protruding from a dendrite with, of course, the presynaptic terminal filled of, uh, with vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter glutamate at excitatory synapses. <clears throat> and in the post-synapse, uh, what's been What's been uh, found very early on is that there is a very high density of proteins, as evident here by this uh, rich uh, electron dense uh, material. And it's really work about the, in the last 30 years from uh, molecular biology and biochemistry, which has allowed uh, the characterization of really the molecular composition of these uh, synapses. So at these excitatory synapses, of course, you have all the presynaptic release machinery. I love the presynapse, but I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, in the post-synapse, of course, you have all the glutamate receptors. They come in different flavors, mainly ex um, ionotropic uh, glutamate receptors and metabotropic uh, glutamate receptors. Also, adhesion proteins that link the pre- and post-synaptic uh, membrane, and then inside the postsynaptic density is this uh, huge uh, assembly of scaffolding molecules together with enzyme and cytoskeletal element that make up the postsynaptic density, allow the stabilization of receptors, and allow also uh, signal uh, transduction. We are going to concentrate tonight on one subtype of glutamate receptors, uh, the AMPA subtype of glutamate receptors, because those really mediate the vast majority, if not all, of fast excitatory synaptic transmission. Uh, those uh, AMPA type glutamate receptors are tetramers. They are made up of uh, four different subunits, a product of four genes, GLUA1 to GLUA4. Uh, they've been crystallized uh, about 10 years ago by the group of Eric Guo. And uh, this crystal structure that you see here has made up realize that, in fact, uh, they are, these receptors are not only ion channels, but they also have a huge uh, amino terminus or extracellular domain that's so big, uh, about 10 nanometer, that in, it nearly touches the presynaptic membrane. And probably this has some important functions we'll discuss slightly later on. Uh, these receptors don't come alone. They are actually part of a big complex. And uh, what it's called uh, part of this complex are called the uh, AMPA receptor auxiliary subunits. Uh, the first one, characterized by the group of Roger Nicol, is a member of the TAP family, uh, the very famous uh, stargazing uh, that you see here has been uh, co-imaged co by a cryo -EM by the group of Sob Sobolevsky here. You see those two TAPs here flanking the receptor. Those auxiliary subunits are extremely important, as we'll see later on, to actually regulate both the function and the trafficking of the receptors. Uh, the story would be too simple with just one type of auxiliary subunit. Actually, work from many, many groups has shown that there is probably over a dozen of these different auxiliary subunits that uh, compose uh, an AMPA receptor uh, complex. A point uh, that I really like to stress that's probably been very much overlooked over the years uh, is that these AMPA receptors have a pretty low affinity for glutamate. Actually, depending on the subunit composition, in the order of a few hundred uh, micromolar. And uh, I think that's extremely important. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, a while ago, it was thought that uh, receptors would be activated all over the postsynaptic density. But actually, because there's only a small number of uh, glutamate molecules in a given uh, synaptic vesicle, and because of the low affinity of AMPA receptors, Actually, uh, if you simulate uh, transmitter release and activation of these AMPA receptors, uh, you realize that receptors are probably only activated in a small area, probably around 100 nanometer uh, full width half maximum, uh, around uh, the site of release of glutamate. And this will be key, actually, to the rest of this presentation. Because this means that if you are an AMPA receptor, if you are localized right in front of the release site, 
or if you are localized just 50 nanometers away or 100 nanometers away from the release site, it's going to make a huge difference. Because if you're in front of the release site, you're activated. If you're 50 nanometers away, your activation is already decreased by 30%. If you are 100 nanometers away, uh, you're barely uh, activated by the release of, of glutamate. And we'll see, we'll see this is probably extremely important. In parallel to this uh, very detailed molecular characterization of the composition of the, of the synapse, both pre- and post-synaptic, uh, also, of course, uh, we came to realize, uh, before I entered that field, actually, uh, that the synapse is also extremely plastic. Uh, you all know the really absolutely seminal work from uh, Bliss and Lomo in the early 70s that demonstrated that upon high-frequency stimulation of uh, afferent fibers here in the, in the hippocampus, uh, you have an enduring fast and enduring increase in the efficacy of synaptic transmission that's called uh, long-term uh, potentiation. Uh, rapidly, actually, this finding was generalized to other structures, in particular to a, f a very famous synapse between the Schaeffer collaterals and the CA1 region of the hippocampus that we'll be uh, working on in the rest of the talk. And also, conversely to long-term potentiation, uh, what was found is that if you do a somewhat different type of stimulation, like low-frequency stimulation, you can induce a rapid uh, de depressing depression of the efficacy of synaptic transmission called long-term depression. So altogether, uh, this... Uh, demonstration that activity can regulate very rapidly and then for a very long time the efficacy of synaptic transmission uh, suggested that this could be maybe a cellular substrate for learning and memory. So although this was postulated very early on already by Bliss and Lomo, it was extremely hotly debated actually when I started my PhD in the Corn Lab uh, a long time ago, uh, there was really a big debate already to know whether LTP had anything to do with physiology or not. We know now it's probably indeed uh, very important for synaptic transmission uh, regulation and learning and memory. We'll see that a, a bit later on. And so anyway, this finding was so striking that it really led a whole generation of neuroscientists to try to understand what's the molecular mechanism for uh, this process. I'm just going to highlight a couple of really the, the milestones in this, uh, in this process. A first important milestone was to identify the site of induction of long-term potentiation. And work in particular by uh, Colin Ridge and colleagues, and, uh, and later on uh, many others, uh, identified that activation of NMDA receptors and calcium influx through NMDA receptors in the post-synapse were absolutely key for the induction of synaptic plasticity. Uh, that was for the induction, uh, and that was accepted pretty rapidly. Uh, then a big debate was opened on uh, whether the expression of long-term potentiation was either pre- or post-synaptic. I'm not going to enter into the details, but certainly a very important milestone to, to resolve this conundrum here uh, was that uh, the discovery of silent synapses by the group of... Uh, Rob Malenka, Roger Nicol, and Roberto Malino in '95, that simultaneously uh, published the discovery of these silent synapses that normally don't have a, an AMPA component, they just have an NMDA component. And then upon a high frequency simulation or pairing, uh, you can actually uh, reveal an AMPA component, showing that a synapse that didn't have an AMPA component could be, uh, become uh, compo uh, having an AMPA component. And this really uh, is kind of the, the basis of a lot of what we've been doing later on. And so the question really uh, I want to address is how can you reconcile the complex structure of the postsynaptic density with the extreme plasticity of the efficacy of synaptic transmission? So right around the turn of the century, there was really a very important paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift was that uh, synaptic plasticity, at least at that synapse, so the very archetypal Schaeffer collateral to CA1 synapse, is underlined by changes in AMPA receptor numbers. And it's very simple. It's now textbook, textbook data that uh, long-term potentiation is underlined by an increase in receptor and AMPA receptor numbers, while long-term depression is underlined by a decrease in AMPA receptor number. And that was really a, a finding uh, by many, many groups uh, at the turn of the century. And this led really to the question of how are AMPA receptor inserted and removed from the post-synapse. And uh, more or less the same groups uh, found that, in fact, the processes of receptor recycling uh, were very important, and in particular that 
amparoceptor exocytosis was very important to increase the number of receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, while receptor endocytosis was very important to decrease receptor in the postsynaptic membrane. And uh, that's about the time where I started my own group in Bordeaux, and there were a lot of reviews published around the year 2000, 99, 2000 or so, uh, showing this type of scheme where uh, receptors would enter and leave the postsynaptic density by processes of endo and exocytosis. I was not a neuroscientist at the time. I was coming from a very different uh, area. I was actually uh, doing single particle tracking in the lab of Mike Sheets, tracking integrins on migrating fibroblasts. And uh, just spending all my days and nights and weekends uh, tracking the movement of those membrane proteins. And when I arrived in Bordeaux with a completely different, completely different topic, uh, being good friend with a very good uh, neuroscientist in Bordeaux, Christophe Mule, uh, and seeing these schemes, I thought something was missing because I, I knew perfectly that membrane proteins what they do, they diffuse in the plane of the membrane. And so I decided, kind of a, a bit as a side project, to test whether this was also true in neurons, whether indeed AMPA receptors would also be diffusing in the plane of the membrane as they should, as they should do as a good um, transmembrane protein. So we used the technique that was available at the time, pretty crude but still very informative, using large latex beads to track the movement of AMPA receptors at the surface of uh, cultured hippocampal neurons. And of course, uh, those AMPA receptors did what every single transmembrane protein should do in a membrane. They diffuse that pretty high rate by bronion agitation due to thermal agitation of molecules. And so together with my good friend uh, Antoine Triller, we showed that both inhibitory receptors, glycine receptors, GABA receptors, but also AMPA receptors, and then later on NMDA receptors diffu diffuse in the plane of the membrane. So this was really establishing that at least in the extrasynaptic membrane, uh, those receptors diffused uh, as, as, as they should do. Uh, at the same time, more or less, several groups showed that indeed there's a high proportion of extrasynaptic receptors. Uh, I'm showing here, for example, uh, work from the group of Kasai using glutamate caging, showing that in the extrasynaptic membrane, uh, you have an AMPA component of course, much smaller than the concentrated response that you get in synapses, but still uh, pretty sizable. And this was, of course, confirmed later on by EM here, for example, from the group of Rees, showing a lot of these extrasynaptic uh, receptors. So because extrasynaptic receptors were diffusing so rapidly, uh, we thought that maybe, well, they would actually be, could be, a, could exchange with synaptic receptors. Of course, this first technique of latex beads, there was no way it could actually reveal the movement of receptors into synapses. And I was very fortunate at that time to be able to couple, actually, uh, with a group of physicists in Bordeaux, uh, Laurent Cogny and Brian Lunis, which were experts, really, in single molecule tracking. And uh, when we started to talk, we got very excited at the possibility of, to use uh, single molecule tracking to look at the movement of receptors inside synapses. And I, I went to visit their lab uh, the first time. I was a bit surprised by the instrument they were using because there was a, a lot of uh, white fumes coming out of the instrument. And I told them, well, what, what's the white fume? And they told me, well, that's liquid helium. Liquid helium, why? Well, to look at single molecules, you know, we have to work at four degrees K. Well, I said, well, we have a problem there because looking at receptor diffusion at four degrees K is gonna be a problem. And so this was the, the launch of a fantastic collaboration where we were actually, they were able to raise the temperature to 37 degrees uh, to actually look at the diffusion of receptors uh, with single molecule tracking. So it's a very nice technique. Uh, you'll, you'll see much more of that later on, uh, where you can use small probes like antibodies or fragments of antibodies to bind to the extracellular domain of receptors, tag them with a fluorophore. Uh, you're, of course, very familiar to that now because all the, all the advent of super-resolution microscopy. Uh, and the very nice aspect of this single molecule tracking thing is that uh, you can really adjust, you can fit the localization of these single molecules with very high accuracy and determine the localization with really a sub-micron and even a few tens of nanometer precision. So using this approach, we were actually able uh, to see single AMPA receptors diffusing in and out uh, the synapt synaptic areas, suggesting that indeed receptors are able to diffuse inside the postsynaptic density. <laughs> 
So more or less at the same time, a uh, very important finding uh, came out uh, from the group of uh, Michael Ehlers, uh, finding that sites of receptor recycling were not in the postsynaptic density, but probably several tens and hundreds of nanometers away from the postsynaptic density. You see here a clathrin coat where receptors are endocytosed. And so you see that if receptors are to be endocytosed, where they really have to diffuse out of the PSD to enter into the postsynaptic density. So altogether, taking all these data together, uh, this led us uh, to propose this scheme where uh, the number of receptors at the postsynaptic density actually results from a dynamic equilibrium between receptors in the extrasynaptic membrane and receptors in intracellular compartments. And of course, to have accumulation of receptors in the postsynaptic density, you need to have them to bind to stable elements, scaffold elements. Uh, we are going to see that a bit, a bit later on. And so it's really an equilibrium between uh, stabilizing the receptors and diffusion of the receptors in the extrasynaptic membrane and that's really the process that we call uh, diffusion trapping that I'm going to talk about over and over again. And so really the message here is that if you want to understand how you regulate the number of receptors in front of the glutamate release site, you really have to put numbers everywhere on all these different uh, arrows. So there are many ways to do that. And of course, uh, because this is all going to be regulated by neuronal activity, uh, signaling is extremely important. And there's been very important work uh, to actually try to understand what are the various signaling events which are responsible for uh, regulation of this virus trafficking event. I just want to quote one here, because I think it's very important. It's really uh, the work that uh, Rick Hugeni has been doing, uh, highlighting that for phosphorylation and dephosphorylation events of uh, AMPA receptor sub subunits play such an important role in regulating uh, receptor trafficking and stabilization. Uh, the view we, we've been taking is slightly different. We've been really trying to uh, actually image those various events of, of trafficking uh, to try to understand in live neurons how uh, you can really regulate uh, these different pathways. Uh, you can look at intracellular transport of receptors. Uh, this is actually, although that's the first thing that happens to a receptor once it's been synthesized, it's actually been pretty difficult to, to image. It's only very recently that our group and the group of uh, Viru Marik uh, and a couple others have been able to visualize this intracellular transport of Ampar receptor. For a matter of time, I won't uh, give you details on this, uh, but it's certainly something that's going to be extremely regulated and extremely important. Uh, when receptors make it uh, near the synapse, they of course have to be exocytosed to make it to the cell surface. And uh, this has been imaged also by many groups, the group of Rick, the group of Von Zastro, the group of Malino about 10 years ago, and using a pH-dependent form of GFP that is uh, quenched at acidic pH in two intracellular vesicles, you can very well uh, visualize the exocytosis of uh, individual vesicles. Uh, in early work, actually, most of the exocytosis was seen uh, in the dendrite of, of neurons. Now there is somewhat more recent work that also sees exocytosis directly in the spine head. But I would say that uh, a, a, a large proportion of the exocytosis actually occurs in the dendrite. Uh, conversely, using the same trick, you can also visualize receptor endocytosis. This is work, recent work from our lab. And each little blink that you see here is actually an, a vesicle being internalized. Uh, and you see that there's a lot of internalization going on, on the, in the dendrite, some internalization going on in the spine. So if you take one and one together, uh, if exocytosis occurs uh, outside the PSD, if internalization occurs outside of the PSD, that really means that this process of diffusion trapping is absolutely key, once again, uh, to regulate uh, receptor number. And so we've really pushed and done uh, experiments over experiments and developing new and new approaches to try to visualize this process the best possible. Uh, this is just one illustration of it, uh, using a technique we don't use so much anymore, using single particle tracking with a small nano quantum dot bound to the extracellular domain of endogenous receptors. And there also you can see very well diffusing extrasynaptic receptors and receptors that can enter and leave uh, synaptic sites. So now I'm going to get into, I would say, uh, very specific stories. Uh, 
four quick stories. Uh, we are going to go from really looking at the AMPA receptor nanoscale dynamic organization with super resolution microscopy uh, to really try to understand the function of these AMPA receptor surface trafficking pathways in both short and long term plasticity. And then I'll tell you how, by modulating uh, these trafficking pathways, we think we can learn things about. Uh, higher brain function and synaptic plasticity, and also how this is altered uh, in various disease models. So first, now uh, looking at AMPA receptor nanoscale uh, dynamic organization, this is really work uh, we started together in a very nice collaboration with Jean-Baptiste Sibareta, together with Eric Ozzi in my group. Uh, as I said, we've been really trying to develop smaller and smaller probes and brighter and brighter dyes uh, to label those receptors. Uh, our favorite tools now are really fab fragments of uh, antibodies to endogenous receptors or another approach using monomeric streptavidin, I will tell you uh, a bit later on, uh, and using various ways to track those single molecules, in particular this paint technique that I, I, I really like. Uh, using this approach, Using this, this approach, uh, you can visualize receptor movement, uh, very mobile in the extrasynaptic membrane, and also you can visualize receptor movement entering and leaving uh, synaptic sites, which are here labeled with Homer as a synaptic marker. And it's very striking as you see that receptors diffuse, and then they can enter into the PSD and be stabilized. So I'm claiming this is the PSD, but uh, maybe you don't quite believe me, because actually, although the resolution of the tracking here is very, very high, I, as I said, about 20 nanometer precision, uh, the resolution here on this movie of the synaptic site is not very high because it's diffraction limited, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. First, from this type of movies, you can do very nice quantifications. Uh, you can uh, measure the rate of diffusion of receptors in the dendritic or the synaptic sites. Uh, in dendrites, you see lots of mobile receptors, also some immobile receptors. What's interesting is what you see inside synapses. Inside synapses, you basically see two types of movements. Either, I would say, immobile receptors, trapped receptors, or receptors that move, but they don't go very far. They are, they are confined because they are in a confined environment. You can quantify that uh, using a, the surface explored versus time of the receptor. You see that the slope of these curves is the diffusion coefficient, the speed at which the receptor moves. You see that dendritic receptors move much faster than synaptic receptors, but synaptic receptors still uh, do move. I told you uh, that uh, this localization of receptors was not very satisfactory because indeed the label we use for synaptic stain is only visualized with a diff diffraction limited uh, wide field imaging. So what we are doing now, and that's really a work in progress, is actually combine various super resolution methods to really get the same very high resolution for the localization of the postsynaptic density and the localization of the receptors. What you see here uh, is a work do done in collaboration with Valentin Nagel and Jean-Baptiste Sibarita at the Institute, where we were using STED of cytosolic GFP, which is a volume marker to image the dendrite, the spine head, and the, and the spine neck. We are using PALM, which is a single molecule tracking approach, uh, to look at the distribution of PSD95 with about 30 nanometer precision. And then we use U-paint of AMPA receptors to look at the receptor tracking. So if you do that, you can plot the diffusion coefficient of the receptors. Uh, in the extrasynaptic membrane, they diffuse pretty rapidly. Uh, in the neck of the spine, they diffuse almost at the same speed than in the dendrite. Now, if you look at the diffusion in the spine head, you already see that it decreases a little, but not that much, actually. If you take the whole, the whole spine head, the receptors still diffuse pretty fast. But now what we can do is really look at the diffusion of receptors exactly on the postsynaptic density. And there, here, you see um, a shift to the left, because indeed receptors are sizably less mobile in the postsynaptic density uh, than they are in the, in the rest of the compartments. But you still have about 25% of the receptors that move at pretty high rate uh, in the PSD. And that, I will come back to that, because I think that's really important. So that's a lot about the trafficking and the movement of the receptors. What about their organization, really? So if you really want to see at the look at the organization of the receptors at high resolution, you have to work on fixed cells. And the technique of choice for that is called STORM. It's another uh, single molecule uh, localization technique. And what we found uh, five years ago, what we published five years ago, is that uh, AMPA receptors are not diffusely distributed in the postsynaptic density, uh, was as was uh, previously thought. But 
but they are actually concentrated in small domains, uh, which are about uh, 80 nanometer full width have maximum, and there's about 25 receptors per nano domain. Uh, what's very interesting is that uh, the number of domains per spine actually is extremely proportional to the size of the spine head. And there was a very nice paper by the group of Dalva uh, just last year showing that indeed during chemical LTP, <coughs> the increase uh, in spine head that you see during uh, synaptic potentiation is actually strictly paralleled by an increase in number of modules like that of uh, AMPA receptors, as if, as if when the spine grows, what it does is that it actually adds a new uh, module. So altogether, uh, for this uh, nanoscale distribution of receptors, I would say the view that's relatively well accepted now in the field is that uh, AMPA receptors in the postsynaptic density come in at least two flavors. Uh, a large part of them, a big half of them, I would say, uh, is immobile in those uh, clusters. But in between those, re those uh, clustered uh, receptors, you have a sizable pool of mobile receptors, and about 30% of them are able to exchange between synaptic sites and uh, extrasynaptic sites. So I really became completely fascinated by those mobile receptors uh, because I thought, you know, if nature has kept such a large fraction of uh, mobile receptors, it's not for nothing. Those mobile receptors have to have a given function. And so we've really been trying to develop ways to study the function of these mobile receptors, and that's the stories I'm, I'm going to tell you now. So as you all know, if you want to study a phenomenon, you really, the best uh, scientific approach is to try to modify it and see what's the impact of those modifications on, um, on, on the function you're looking at. And so what we've been developing is a variety of ways to really modify amperoreceptor surface diffusion to look at the impact on the efficacy of synaptic transmission. And so it's about 10 years ago that uh, Martin Heiner, who was a postdoc in the group, had this idea, pretty simple, uh, to use cross-linking agents, and the best one, uh, of course, is uh, our antibodies, that are able to bind several uh, antigens, and uh, to use that to actually cross-link surface receptors and immobilize them. And that actually works surprisingly well. The reason it works surprisingly well is that because you already have in control condition, in basal state, a certain fraction of receptors which are immobile, uh, when you put a cross-linking agent, actually the mobile receptors are going to be cross-linked immediately to uh, nearby immobile receptors. So you're not going to have a massive reorganization of the receptors. They are like frozen on site uh, when you apply a cross-linking agent. So we could demonstrate that indeed when you apply these cross-linking agents, uh, you increase considerably the fraction of immobile receptors. You see here, if you look at the surface explored versus time, both extrasynaptic and synaptic receptors are immobilized. Uh, more recently, uh, doing a pre-embedding EM, uh, we could show that indeed the distribution of receptors uh, before and after cross-linking doesn't uh, really change. You see here a quantification that before and after cross-linking, uh, the density of, of uh, AMPA receptors in the spine head, for example, doesn't really change. Actually, this is really mirrored by the absence of effect of this cross-linking on basal synaptic transmission. This is just one example. If you look at AMPA and MDA ratios, for example, in control condition and after AMPA receptor cross-linking, you see that basal synaptic transmission is not affected. So with this tool in hand, we could really uh, start asking what are the function of this AMPA receptor surface trafficking. And so the first story I want to tell you briefly is something that was completely unexpected. I would say probably 95% of physiologists still really don't believe that, but I'm a bit stubborn, and so I really keep on working on it, and I think it's going to be very important down the road. So I want to share this with you. And that's really the unexpected contribution of AMPA receptor surface diffusion to short-term plasticity. And that's, that work was really spearheaded by Martin Heiner more than 10 years ago, but then it was carried on by a whole, uh, whole series of brave post dogs that have been uh, following me on this idea. So, as I said, we are going to compare uh, synaptic transmission in control conditions when the receptors are mobile and uh, after AMPA receptor cross-linking. So, when uh, Martin did those experiments first, so he found no effect on basal transmission, uh, as, as I said, but then he started to apply uh, paired pulse protocols uh, just as a control, and he was extremely surprised by the result. By, because when he cross-linked surface receptors, applying short pulse uh, 
uh, pulses at short intervals, about 50 milliseconds here in pulse interval, he, see, he saw that although the first pulse amplitude was not modified, there was a depression in the amplitude of the second pulse. That was extremely weird, because I'm sure most of you know, uh, this is a change in paired pulse ratio, is taken really as the hallmark of a change in transmitter release. So how could it be that a change in postsynaptic amplitude receptor uh, diffusion would actually impact something that is thought to be a signature of a change in transmitter release. So to make sure we didn't have an interference here of transmitter release, uh, what we did is use glutamate iontophoresis, which gets rid of the presynaptic component by applying very focally uh, glutamate, and we could reproduce exactly the same thing when you cross-link uh, receptors, you see uh, here a very strong depression uh, that, that emerge uh, as compared to control condition. So how could it be? Well, we came up with an hypothesis, and this hypothesis is the following. So Empire receptors are normally closed. Upon glutamate release, they get open. And very rapidly, they get desensitized within a few milliseconds. And what's key is that recovery from empire receptor desensitization is relatively slow. There also, it depends on the subunit composition, but it's typically in the order of uh, tens and tens of, of milliseconds. So that means that you have, if you have a second vesicle released on the same location, actually, uh, because you still have desensitized receptors, you're going to have depression due to uh, postsynaptic desensitization of receptors. And so what we've been proposing is that when empire receptors are mobile, actually those desensitized receptors can be exchanged for naive ones, and this allows for a faster recovery from synaptic depression. As I said, uh, this is a bit heretic still. Uh, how could it be that receptors move fast enough to actually be exchanged with such a, a short time frame? Of course, vesicle release has to occur more or less on the same location. That's also an important uh, point to, to consider. Uh, what we've done over the years is really first try to correlate uh, this uh, short-term plasticity with changes in receptor movement. And it's really striking that every manipulation that we've been doing to modify receptor movement has actually has a parallel impact on short-term plasticity. Just two examples we published over the years. When you remove the extra serial matrix, you actually increase receptor diffusion. That's common sense. There are less obstacles. Receptors diffuse faster, as seen here by those FRAP experiments. Uh, and uh, you have less depression when you do uh, paired pulse stimulation. Conversely, if you uh, stabilize more the receptors, and we've been using, doing that, for example, here, by genetically linking empire receptors to their auxiliary subunit, uh, the TARP stargazing, so receptors move less, as seen here in this plot. And when you do that, well, you get more depression. So these are, there are just two examples, but we've, we've had others, where when you change receptor mobility, you directly modify uh, this short-term plasticity. So how could it be? How could receptors move fast enough to actually regulate uh, in this such a short time frame uh, the, the response to, uh, to, to transmitter release? Well, maybe we have a small hint on why, why, why is that, and that's something we, we published just a few years ago, is that actually receptor mobility is highly regulated by its conformation. Uh, what you see here is uh, tracks of receptors which are uh, point mutated, and they are locked in given conformations. These are closed receptors, non-desensitizing receptors, or desensitized receptors. And you see that desensitized receptors move much faster than closed receptors. That's quantified here. You see the green curve are the desensitized receptors. They move much faster than the closed one. How could it be? How could conformation of a receptor actually change uh, its mobility in the membrane? Well, there also we have a hint. And the hint comes from actually looking at how do you stabilize receptors in the postsynaptic density. We're going to talk a bit more about that just in a second. But basically, uh, what many labs have shown, Roger in first, but then uh, many others, is that the, these auxiliary proteins, the TARP, are extremely important to stabilize receptors in the postsynaptic density through the interaction of the TARP with the very famous uh, scaffold protein, PSD95. What we have actually shown is that uh, desensitized receptors actually unbind from the TARPs, as you can see here in these co-IPs. Uh, and we think that uh, when receptors get desensitized, this unbinding from the TARP actually allows them to move faster. 
and uh, something that's a bit of a fantasy, but I like this m kind of artificial movie from uh, the group of Gould, from uh, cryo-EM, of uh, the extracellular domains of ampar receptors, and you see that upon receptor desensitization, there is a huge conformational change. And so one could think that indeed this conformational change uh, leads to um, escape of the receptors from their stabilizing element. So uh, enough for this, I, I would say, still a bit controversial finding that postsynaptic amparoceptor diffusion can affect something that is normally seen as a hallmark of a presynaptic change in transmitters. I'm going to go now to something which is, I would say, slightly more classical, even though uh, still very uh, exciting. And that's really uh, what's the contribution of amparoceptor surface trafficking and the respective contribution of receptor trafficking uh, and exocytosis to the process of long-term plasticity. So this is a story that actually started a long time ago. Uh, when we did the very first recordings of ampar receptor surface diffusion, uh, we realized that uh, this is extremely regulated. Actually, in my whole life as a scientist, ampar receptor surface diffusion is one of the most uh, highly regulated process that we've been uh, observing. And what we've been finding over and over again, and many other people have uh, reproduced this finding, is that uh, when you do high-frequency stimulation or ChemLTP protocols, or you name it, anything that triggers fast calcium entry through NMDA receptors, uh, the first thing that happens is that receptors uh, get immobilized. This is one example of a uh, tracking ampar receptors upon high frequency stimulation you see that very rapidly uh, they get immobilized and you can uh, quantify that by looking at the diffusion coefficient so this is really this, this process of diffusion trapping and very activity dependent diffusion trapping and very early on we thought that well because activity triggers this trapping of receptors maybe this is going to be a key phenomenon to actually increase the concentration of receptors at synapses during activity dependent synaptic potentiation uh, it took us actually many, many years to come to this, uh, to test really this hypothesis. Uh, but in between, what we've been doing, and together with many other groups, is really find out uh, what was the molecular mechanism for this process. I'm just going to summarize it in one, one cartoon. Uh, that's really summarizing work from many groups, a group of Roger, the group of Susumu Tomita, our group, and, and many others. And it really involves uh, this protein, this auxiliary protein, uh, stargazing, which is really very interesting features. Uh, it has, uh, at its C-terminus, a PDZ binding site that binds to PSD95. And it also has this sensor here, which is a set of serines, which can be phosphorylated by CAMKNS2 and other enzymes, and which is surrounded by a stretch of arginines, which are positively charged. And what uh, we showed, together with the group of Susumu, is that uh, this sensor actually binds to the plasma membrane and uh, in control conditions, in at resting conditions, allowing receptors to diffuse. Upon calcium influx through NMD receptors, this activates CAM kinase 2 that phosphorylates the serines and allows unbinding of the C-terminus from the plasma membrane, increasing the stabilization on PSD95. So that's uh, for this molecular mechanism. Vice versa, we really wanted to know whether is diffusion trapping really necessary for LTP. And I've been very frustrated actually for many years because we couldn't test this hypothesis because all our work was done in primary cultures and uh, as some of you know, doing LTP in primary cultures is not that easy. So it's only actually relatively recently that we decided to really make a big jump and move to brain slices to really test this hypothesis. And the idea was, well, we are going to interfere with ampar receptor to surface trafficking and we are going to look at this process of long-term potentiation. Uh, we tried initially to block receptor surface diffusion with antibodies in brain slices. It didn't work. Now we, could, we found ways to make it to work. Uh, but the postdoc at the time, Andrew Penn, who was on that project, had a brilliant idea. He said, well, uh, instead of using antibodies, who maybe uh, are going to have a hard time to diffuse into the brain slice, uh, let's use a smaller crosslinker. Let's use, for example, avidin, which is a very high affinity tetrameric crosslinker that's going to be very nice to immobilize receptors in brain slices. Uh, the only thing we had to do is biotinylate receptors, and that actually, uh, at the time, uh, became pretty easy because of a trick that was developed by Alice Ting, allowing to biotinylate receptors in live neurons. 
Uh, the trick is the following. You just have to tag your receptor with a small acceptor peptide, 15 amino acid peptide, uh, that is biotinated by the enzyme biotin ligase. And by co-expressing tagged receptors uh, together with the ER-resident biotin ligase, you get biotination of receptors in live neurons, and you get uh, those biotination, biotinated receptors on the cell surface that you can then cross-link with tetrameric avidin. Uh, with this system, you can express those tagged receptors together with uh, biotin ligase in brain slices by single cell electroporation. Receptors get biotinated very nicely, as can be seen here by labeling uh, those neurons in brain slices by fluorescent avidin. You see very nice expression of biotinated receptors. We've made a whole series of various controls. First of all, receptors do get immobilized when you cross-link them. Uh, here, as seen with FRAP, you see much less mobile receptors upon application of the cross-linker. Very importantly, uh, this tagging or cross-linking doesn't affect the biophysical properties of the receptors. Uh, if you look at desensitization, activation, or deactivation, it's not affected by this process of cross-linking. Also, very importantly, uh, we could show that these uh, GLUA2 tagged receptors uh, make it to the synapse. Uh, here, uh, we've been expressing those tagged receptors uh, in a null background, a GLUA2 knockouts. Uh, in this null background, you have strong rectification because you only have GLUA1 containing AMPA receptors. And then, upon re expression of these tagged receptors, you get normal expression. So with this system in hand, uh, we could then really ask the question I've been willing to ask for the last 15 years, which is, is surface diffusion contributing in any manner to long-term potentiation? So in these organotypic slices, you can get bona fide LTP by doing high-frequency stimulation here. Uh, and then what we are going to do is we are going to modify uh, receptor trafficking in various ways. The first thing we are going to do is just immobilize uh, pre-existing receptors on the neuronal surface and then wash out new travidin in order to let the system evolve normally. Uh, when we've done that, uh, I was really absolutely striking that uh, by immobilizing pre-existing receptors on the cell surface, we completely wiped out the initial phase of synaptic potentiation here in these organotypic slices. So that was really showing or suggesting strongly at least that diffusion trapping of AMPA receptors was absolutely mandatory for this initial phase of synaptic potentiation. What Andrew observed when he did those experiments is that even though the initial phase was completely wiped out, uh, after a few minutes, he actually saw a creeping up of the signal that he couldn't really get rid of. So we thought, well, maybe this is actually due uh, to another category of receptors. Maybe these are exocytose receptors that can then diffuse because there's no more streptavidin in the bath. So that was pretty easy to check. We just had to put uh, um, neutravidin here, which is the the neutral firm of evidin we use for cross-linking, uh, both to uh, cross-link pre-existing receptors and also uh, uh, in the bath. And doing that, uh, we could get rid of all the phases of synaptic potentiation, uh, suggesting that indeed uh, the second phase was due to uh, exocytosis of receptors. An alternative way to look at that was to reproduce an experiment that was done initially by Liedo and Nicole in 98, was to block receptor exocytosis using tetanus toxin uh, in the pipette. So you block this phase of receptor exocytosis. When you do that, you are left with an initial phase of potentiation that decreases very rapidly. Many people have done those experiments. Usually that phase is attributed to uh, presynaptic uh, tetanic potentiation. Actually, in those organotypic slices, there is no presynaptic tetanic potentiation. Actually, this phase is actually entirely postsynaptic because you can completely block it by blocking uh, surface diffusion of receptors. So in summary, uh, for this part, uh, that's the view we have now. Uh, upon tetanic stimulation, uh, you have two things that happen nearly simultaneously. One is presynaptic pre uh, tetanic potentiation that's observed particularly in acute slices that we don't see in this other preparation, but we see it in acute slices. Uh, simultaneously, actually, re really within the same time frame, you have uh, activation of the postsynaptic signaling cascade and diffusion trapping of AMPA receptors. And actually, both presynaptic tetanic potentiation and postsynaptic diffusion trapping of receptors actually synergize to give this early phase of synaptic potentiation. It's actually very difficult to study in some sense uh, because the presynaptic and the postsynaptic phase really occur within the same time frame and uh, decrease within the first uh, few minutes of synaptic potentiation. 
What I've shown you, and that's really been beautifully shown recently by the group of uh, Studoff and Malenka, is that receptor exocytosis that occurs a bit later on is actually absolutely mandatory to get bona fide long-term potentiation. Uh, but I've shown you that with tetanus toxin, but there's a whole set of papers uh, that show that indeed the second phase is absolutely mandatory to maintain synaptic potentiation. This is actually very weird, uh, because in theory, you should just need diffusion trapping, and then this should be enough to maintain synaptic potentiation. For some reason that we don't really understand, and I don't believe that it's really putting more receptors. I think there is something more to it that we, we still don't know. Uh, you do need absolutely uh, membrane exocytosis to maintain uh, synaptic potentiation. Uh, Something very recent uh, that we are doing in the same direction is really to try to see whether this absolutely mandatory requirement of diffusion trapping for this initial phase of synaptic potentiation, is it something that's only uh, specific to this art a bit artificial high-frequency tetanus stimulation, or is it more general? Is synaptic potentiation in general uh, actually sensitive to diffusion trapping? Just going to show you one example of what we are doing now in collaboration uh, with Fred Gambino and a very talented student, Thiago, um, in, the, in the Institute, which is to look whether MPA receptor mobility is actually also involved in plasticity induced by physiological uh, stimulations. Just to introduce you very briefly to this uh, topic, uh, what we are doing is using uh, whisker stimulation and recording uh, synaptic transmission in the layer 2-3 neurons uh, of the brachial cortex. And uh, at that synapse, uh, it's been shown by the group of Gamino, uh, actually when he was a postdoc in the Tony Oldman, that uh, this high-frequency uh, whisker stimulation triggers long-term potentiation that's NMDA-dependent. And uh, Rick showed a few years ago that this was actually associated, the same type of stimuli was actually associated with an increase in ampere receptor number in the post-synapse. Well, uh, we've been using our cross-linking approach in vivo uh, to see whether receptor diffusion was actually needed for this synaptic potentiation. And what you see here is that when you cross-link surface AMPA receptor, you completely wipe out this uh, physiologically induced long-term potentiation that is uh, normal uh, when you just apply a cross-linking antibody. So it's really, to me, a very exciting times now because we have this tool, this cross-linking tool, that at least when you use it relatively acutely seems, seems relatively innocuous and really freezes the synapse in a given state. And so we thought that maybe Maybe this could be actually useful to see whether uh, by blocking synaptic plasticity we could actually affect some higher brain functions. And I'll give you one example of the type of work we are doing from something we just published uh, last year, which is uh, to use this AMPA receptor immobilization probe uh, to look for the role of synaptic plasticity in some forms of memory. And uh, I'm, I'm very naive and uh, really just learning uh, what, what uh, this is all about. And it's really exciting, I would say, at, at, my, point, at my point in my career to really go in this very new, uh, new area. Uh, so what we are doing is uh, using various uh, protocols to trigger uh, learning. Just one example here, using the very classical contextual fear conditioning, we are going to cross-link receptors and see what this does uh, to... Um, learning of this uh, contextual fear conditioning. So first, uh, mice get habituated to a given context. Uh, then we inject either cross-linking antibodies or control antibodies. Uh, and then uh, mice are shocked in that context and then uh, they freeze, whether they are injected with cross-linking antibodies or control antibodies, so they behave normally, I would say. Uh, and then we let them to rest for 24 hours and we are going to check whether they remember uh, the context. So then we put the mice back in the context. The control mice freeze. They remember this, this was an aversive uh, context associated with an aversive stimuli. Uh, but then uh, the mice in which receptor surface diffusion has been blocked uh, freeze much less, as you can see here. So that's very exciting to me. It's really the beginning of the story uh, to use this cross-linking uh, agent to actually be able to try to link uh, synaptic plasticity and uh, learning and, and memory. To finish, a uh, few words also on uh, what happens to these surface trafficking uh, pathways in various disease models. Uh, we've actually worked over the years on many uh, different models of uh, synaptopathies. Uh, we've worked on stress, we've worked on Alzheimer models, and we've worked on Huntington's models, uh, which are all models where synaptic plasticity is affected, and that is thought to be related to early cognitive deficits. 
And uh, I'm just going to tell you one of these stories briefly, uh, just to illustrate the fact that indeed we think that uh, alteration in AMPA receptor trafficking could actually explain some aspects of defects in synaptic plasticity that could lead to uh, defects in um, co uh, early cognitive functions. So I'm sure you all know about Huntington's disease. Uh, this is due to a polyglutamine expansion in the protein Huntington. Uh, it's a very large protein with many functions, but certainly one of the key functions is in intracellular transport because Huntington is an adapter uh, for molecular motors and cargo. And the polyglutamine expansion form of Huntington has an abnormal uh, adapter function. And work in particular from the group of SODU uh, in Grenoble has shown that uh, Huntington mutants uh, protein really have a defect in particular in BDNF uh, transport. What's been known for a while, published by many groups, is that in, in hunting team models, you have a defect in synaptic potentiation, in long-term potentiation in particular. And because of this defect in uh, long-term potentiation, we thought, well, maybe there is something that's related to ampere receptor trafficking. And so we decided to look at what's the property of ampere receptor trafficking in those various hunting team, uh, Huntington's uh, model. Uh, to cut a long story short, what we found in the probably five or six different models that we've studied, is that uh, AMPA receptor uh, move much more in these uh, various Huntington models as compared to Y-type models. You see here a much higher uh, movement. We've been, of course, trying to understand what's the molecular mechanism for that. It's actually very complex. I'm just going to summarize it as, as a cartoon. It involves BDNF. Uh, in normal conditions, you know, BDNF is secreted, activates TRAC-B receptors, and uh, track B receptors synergize together with calcium influx to NMDA receptors to activate CAM kinase. And this, of course, leads to phosphorylation of TARPs and then stabilization of the, of the receptors. What we found is actually that uh, when Huntington has this polyglutamine expansion, you have much less transport of BDNF, which leads to less production of BDNF. Uh, this leads to lower activation of CAM kinase and a loss in the interaction between the TARPs and PSD95 that eventually leads to this increase in AMPA receptor diffusion and impaired uh, long-term potentiation. Finally, just to give you an outlook maybe of some uh, crazy ideas we have for the future, is that, well, maybe if there's a relation between AMPA receptor trafficking and long-term potentiation or synaptic plasticity and cognitive deficits, maybe if we can find ways to correct AMPA receptor trafficking, this could have an impact on uh, cognitive deficits. So just one, one lead on, on something we've been doing recently is actually finding a drug. This is called the French antidepressant, uh, Tianeptin, because it's not, not for sale in the States, unfortunately. Um, Tianeptin actually is very efficient at restoring BDNF production and BDNF transport. It actually restores also normal AMPA receptor uh, surface trafficking. Uh, it restores long-term potentiation and it restores uh, normal fear conditioning. So it's a bit of a magic drug, probably too nice to be true. But anyway, that's, a, that's the idea. The idea is really by, by modifying AMPA receptor tra trafficking, maybe we're going to be able to actually correct some uh, very important synaptic deficits and some uh, cognitive deficits. So to conclude, I'm going to really try to summarize a few, a few messages. So really, receptors use many, many routes to traffic to enter and leave synapses. And you really have to integrate all of them uh, to, if you want to understand how uh, AMPA receptor trafficking regulates uh, the efficacy of synaptic transmission. AMPA receptors are organized in part in nanodomains, and in between the nanodomains, they are very mobile, and we think this pool of mobile receptors is very important. Uh, it participates to regulate uh, short-term synaptic transmission. It's not an all or none process. It's really like a 25, 30% regulation, but we think it might be very important for uh, information processing by the brain, and we are testing that now. Uh, Empire receptor surface trafficking and exocytosis really cooperate sequentially to mediate long-term potentiation. And artificial immobilization of empire receptors could really may prove to be a very useful tool to free synapses in a given state and look at the interplay between synaptic plasticity and the role of plasticity in uh, learning and behavior. And finally, empire receptor surface trafficking is really affected in a whole variety of various diseases, and uh, this could uh, be lead to new ways to, uh, to actually correct for these deficits. Uh, 
Uh, with that, I'm done. Uh, this work, of course, has involved many, many, many people. I've tried to put uh, my most important collaborators here, and I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>